We've traveled to the far north, we've traveled to the far south, and now we're in the west of Britain. We're on the peninsula that sticks out from the north of Wales. And I'm looking out at the foaming sea ahead of me. And we're here to meet a man who is passionate about Welsh language and Welsh tradition and Welsh music. You might have seen him performing in some of our front room festivals. Gwilym Bowen Rees, the young Welsh singer and songwriter who knows all about the tradition of his country and its language and its customs. And we're going to go for a blustery stroll on the beach with Gwilym if we don't get blown away. Well, good morning. Uh, wonderful to see you. What a day. Nice to see you as well. What a wild, wet, windy day it is today. Uh, I mean, the wind is blowing in, the sea is foaming out there. Is it always like this? It yeah? is not. It is not. You've been very unfortunate. Very often, this is a wonderful place weather-wise. But yeah, not today. But it's very, it's very dramatic. It really <laughs> is. The white waves are crashing onto the beach. And t tell us where we are, just put us in, in context. We are in the village of Aperdaron, which is on the right at the tip of the Hian Peninsula, the peninsula on the, in the northwest of Wales that sticks into the Irish Sea. And this is the, the sort of the last village on that peninsula. And we stood near, well, next to St. Howin's Church. There's a, been a place of worship, been here since the, you know, the 6th or 7th centuries, but this building here is medieval. So a very old place, lots of stories, and very thoroughly Welsh. Right. And we can see a couple of islands through the mist over there. What are those? Those are Gwilanfawr and Gwilanfach, which means the big seagull and the small seagull. But unfortunately, from where we stood now, we, we're not able to see the most beautiful island of all, which is Anisenghi, uh, which is just over the ridge there. In English, they call it Bardsey Island. And what's the story of Bardsey Island? It's been a place of pilgrimage for centuries, and they said three pilgrimages to Bardsey. It counted the same as one to Rome, they said. And, yeah, they say there's 20,000 saints buried on the island. So there was a religious foundation, a community there. That's right, yes, there was a monastery there, and they, they say they used to make whiskey on the island as well. And at, at one point, about a century and a half ago, there was a community of 200 people living there. The island's only a mile long, you know, or, or, and it's had a king, like a lot of island communities do. It's had a king, Brennin Enchi. Yeah, so there's, a, there's lots of stories about the island as well, yes. What, what is this place to you? Because you don't actually live here, do you? You live further east. I do live a bit further east, but I, I've been coming here ever since I was a child with my family and then getting to know people from the area who live in the village. And by now I just, I just come here on many, many weekends just to spend time with my friends here and singing a lot in the pub here. And it's, but you sing yes. in the pub, do you? That's right, yeah. There's a, there's a very rowdy musical bunch uh, living close here. Lots of builders and fishermen. There's still a lot of uh, lobster fishing going around. 
these cliffs here, and a lot of them live locally. So there's there's good songs to be had here. <laughs> yeah, and there's actual pieces of foam flying past you now from the <laughs> sea, and the sea seagulls are riding above us. I, I wonder if, uh, if anything in the churchyard is related to any of the music that you're going to sing for it. There is, yes. There's a grave just around the corner here. Shall we walk around? Yes, we, we, yeah. yes, we can. So one of the songs I'm going to sing is called Galarnad Kuchenchi, which means the Badzi Island lament. The Badzi Islands both lament. The song talks about the ferry, the ferry that was going to Badzi Island, and it, it got shipwrecked in the year 1822. And I had heard the song. There was a, a it was a recorded uh, singing by a local blacksmith here. So on this grave it says, Underneath are interred the remains of Thomas Williams of Badzi Island, mariner, aged 49. He perished in the execution of his duty as master of the Bardsey Light Tender, which was wrecked on the 30th of November, 1822. And also the remains of Sydney, daughter of the above Thomas Williams, aged 20, who lost her life on the same melancholy occasion. Oh my goodness, so that yeah. must have been a terrible shipwreck that, that, that happened. And you can see today why that might have happened, can't you? Because that sea is very threatening. Exactly. I, they say never underestimate, you know, the power of the sea and what it can do. And, you know, the song itself is... It really goes to illustrate how, you know, it, it could really rip the heart out of a community, something like that, you know. And it's, it, the ripples of the event carried on, you know. The, the song was still sung by people here in the 1970s. So, um, yes, a very sad occasion indeed. Long wise wife, trust the vor heli, turn his langri o enci oi. Why the ucheri at quinta scalera, maur winter more I've loved. Why the qued one around the white, tar the wain yaith, tar the oi. Ira thata and tona, shena kreik ya shanu karos. Ati do lavo vistachuel, oiri with an aruint. Milu is ganta tu yarikian, a bisai north nepis hin. Gaif kucheskit dani huilia, ketir ntakla goraguai. O borth me duiti agenchi, ita hiria duichai. Well, a gola hai lakilia. She had got a shuity quaur. Quintotti had the corsewin, Govlin drakin eruin aur. Clawit riat vel tarana, nay sunken a my sequait. A vast mestle with a ten sheen, and his Pan mount kamisk dervisk dirvaur, tera war glaur ar graig vaur gere. Pan mo a well a can hervi, ti os plagi os a play. A dinistri o chong mor vechan, ki va fichan gogan gei. Thomas Williams, a young lawyer, have you seen that the death? He dear vow at the tarvot, are a quail lot or a quaith. I verse at near infinite, are in minute, dear in man. 
And what sort of a community is it now here? What sort of things do people do? Um, a very agricultural area. As I said earlier, there's a, a bit of fishing still going on, but there's a big problem here, as in many other pretty places, of second homes and local people not being able to afford houses in the places where they've grown up because the prices are going sky high. And, you know, there's many of them sitting empty as a second home to somebody. So that's a, a very big problem that's happening here. You know, obviously it's, that's a sad case wherever it happens but there's an extra element of it here which is the linguistic and cultural element because we are you know here is one of the places where welsh is still spoken very naturally day to day everybody here is bilingual but that is really you know it's, it's really at risk of disappearing very soon if people can't live here and stay here and is this part of wales an area where the welsh language finds its heart as it were where the, the welsh language is thrived and, and lived on. It, yes, it is, yes. The West in general, but the North West, yes, has been where it's held on strongest, you know, and I only live maybe 45 minutes east of here, and the accent changes, and I love coming down here, and it's a wonderful accent. I'm saying some words that I had never heard before, you know. There's a really rich, deep, you know, richness to that linguistic element. There's much more than just a way of communication. It's a whole culture within itself that can never be replicated in, in any other way you know so it's it's a it's a very sad when any, anything like that is is at risk so i you know we we must care for it and nourish it can you give some examples of the different words that people use yeah like um so if i would say a little bit i would say which literally means little bit but here they would say Ronbach, which is you know a different word and i had never heard that before you know there's a melody to the way that they speak you know, where I'm from by the mountains is very much monotone. But down here, they go up like that and down like that. And they go, oh, are you going to the town? There, 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 there. There's, a, there's a melody to it, which I love, you know. <laughs> Did you grow up speaking Welsh? I did indeed, yeah. And I, Well, I grew up in a village called Bethel, which is just east of Carnarvon. And you know what? I, now I think about this. The only English I heard growing up was on television. Because, you know, it wasn't in school, it wasn't on the in the shop, you know, it, was, it wasn't around, you know. And indeed, in this area in particular, well, they just published uh, the 1921 census, you know, 100 years ago, and the parish just next to this one, not a single person in that parish could speak a word of English in 1921. Obviously now everybody's bilingual, but some of these monolingual people li lived until the 1970s and 1980s, you know. Now, I'm getting very cold, and I wonder if we might go inside the church. Yes. Which, by the way, has its own history, doesn't it? That's right, it does, yes. And we see some interesting things inside it. So let's get out of the wind. There we are. It is. I always want to say when I get in from you know a cold weather like that, I always repeat this this phrase my grandfather used to say. It's, my nor, my nor, ar landamor, my no irach o irach and chan gavelach, which means it's cold, it's cold by the seaside. It's even colder, colder in Llangevillach, <laughs> <laughs> which is a village in South Wales. And near there's where a sort of from. physical aspect to that as well. You oh, yeah, you have, you, have to, you have to shake when seeing it, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness we're inside the church. And if we, uh, if we just look over here, there's a whole display devoted to R.S. Thomas, the poet and priest, who I think was the vicar here, wasn't he? He was, yes. Yes, he moved here, and he was the vicar here and a couple of churches around here. And he really fell in love with this past the world and with the people themselves. And um, the, it, it's funny because he, he, was, he was quite known for being quite grumpy and angry, but they say he was much kinder in Welsh, they say. <laughs> and some of his poems are, are here on the wall, and, and, and there's one down here which seems very appropriate. I wonder if you would read it out for us. I'll, I'll give it a go. The other. There are nights that are so still that I can hear the small owl calling far off and the fox barking miles away. It is then 
that I lie in the lean hours awake, listening to the swell born somewhere in the Atlantic, rising and falling, rising and falling, wave on wave on the long shore by the village, that is without light and companionless, and the thought comes of that other being who is awake too, letting our prayers break on him, not like this for a few hours, but for days, years, for eternity. That's a wonderful poem, isn't it? And you it can is. hear the sea outside the building breaking onto, onto the shore. It would be great if you'd sing us another song. Uh, do you have another song that's related to this area? Yes, I do. I've got a song by a man called J. Glyn Davis. J. Glyn Davis was a, a Welshman that was brought up in Liverpool. It sounds a bit of a contradiction, but there were many, many people from North Wales mostly that um, moved to Liverpool for work and working at docks, and they spoke Welsh at home. And there's still people around that speak Welsh as a first language, being brought up in Birkenhead and Wallasey and places like that. And he was one of them, but he, would, he had lots of family connections with this part of the world, and he would come here very, very often. And there's a fantastic photo of him up in the pub here in the ship of everybody out, stood outside the pub, as, as you have in lots of these old photos, you know. All these leather-faced fishermen stood outside the pub, you know, frowning. And he's there with his ass and cart, and he's got a clay pipe, and he's beaming, he's smiling, you know. And he wrote this song and many, many other songs to do with seafaring and things like this, which are still popular today. So this one is a really nice one called um, Harbour San Francisco. No guesses there. It means San Francisco Harbour. And it's about a Welshman sitting on the harbour in San Francisco, lo looking up at the moon. And he's a bit of a country bumpkin. He doesn't like being in the big city. And he looks at the moon and he envies that the moon can go so easily and so, you know, without effort to the other side of the world. And the moon can look down on all the faces that he loves. There's this deafening sound of the city by his ear. But he says, if I close my eyes and listen really hard... I can hear the old water wheel outside my house on the Hume Peninsula and you, Moon, uh, looking down on it now. It's, it's a very lovely song. Francisco, mar dat ek kon niet te moor, ek hoor een hanger en nog wel een gemreis, ek ben het door in Harbour San Francisco. I will call it their land A fob man and disclerio A thawig reichion heet it up In Harbour San Francisco And my travel to all I win Or the missing San Francisco. Blind, he 
die borsten schein noch frischer. Gewinnt und dauert er die Hint, nie als er in Gwinster ruist er an. Und damit geht er sich am Plein. Borsten schein noch frischer. That's magnificent. Thank you very much. I just want to ask you about the, the whistling part. Because, um, you know, I, I can whistle a bit, but I feel that my whistling would be unreliable when, you know, put under pressure in a performance. Do you, do you practice whistling? Is it something you've done all your life? Or? I, I, I wouldn't say I practice it. But, uh, only in gigs, you know, it's like mostly to fill in the parts that, you know, a fellow violin player or something would do, you know. So, but, yeah, I, I do it a lot in gigs, I guess. Yeah, so you do use it in In, in, in performances, yes. Yes, yeah. why not? Well, it's a, you know, it's a, fine, it's a fine whistle, you know, and I'm very impressed by it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We've come to another corner of the church now, and there's some astonishing gravestones here from the 6th century. Yeah. What an amazing thing to see. So it says, Veracius priest lives, lies here. So it must be a religious figure that they yeah. buried. And it's a fine old stone building here, isn't it? With the rough hewn stone and the dark pews and the dark pulpit and the candelabra, the iron candelabra hanging from the ceiling. Wonderful, wonderful building to hear your music in. But I, I wanted to know a little bit about your musical life. How, how did music first come into your life? Was it something your mum and dad did? Was it around the house? It was, and in the, the culture we have, we have got a thing called the Eisteddfod, which is uh, this competitive element which involves music, involves art, dance, and that was always present in school, in the village. So you are literally up on stage, either singing or reciting a poem before you know how to say no, really. And it's a, it's a sort of like a half joke, I say sometimes, when people ask, when did you start singing, you know, or when did you decide to start singing? And it's such a silly question, really, because in that culture, if you grow up in that, you never decide to start, you decide to stop, you know, and some people <laughs> so you decide have to, to opt stop. Out, you have to opt yeah. out <laughs> of singing, definitely. And then um, when I was about 14, I was really into pop and rock and indie guitar music, and I started a band with my two cousins. And that was, you know, pop and rock, but in Welsh, of course, because it, it wouldn't even occur to me to sing in anything else. So, yeah, I, sa I sang in that group for about nine years. Um, were you having some success at that time? I mean, as much success as you can in a Welsh language rock scene, you know? And there, and there is quite a Welsh language rock scene, isn't there? There is. And there are some, you know, some very successful Definitely, bands. and it's, it's very interesting to compare... You know, people like to see the Welsh language culture similar to maybe Ireland or Scotland. It's very quite distinct. The language is the strongest element, so the music sort of manifests itself in all kinds of things. You know, I would say there's you know, jazz, pop, electronic music, R&B, all done in Welsh. I would say there's more Welsh language rap and electronic albums being produced every year than folk albums, because hmm. the folk music connection with the language isn't as definite and as strong and distinct as it is, for instance, in Ireland and Scotland. So, so in, in Ireland and Scotland, there would be an English language folk tradition alongside their Gaelic or Gaelic folk tradition. Yes. But here, is the folk tradition almost entirely in the Welsh language? Almost entirely in the... Well, yes. The only two parts of Wales that traditionally weren't Welsh-speaking, or Welsh had disappeared there from there earlier, was um, the south of Pembrokeshire right in the southwest, and the Gower Peninsula in the south, because they say in the Middle Ages there was a Flemish plantation because lots of the lowlands had been flooded, and King Henry I granted them these lands and these Flemish plantations were theirs, and they drove the Welsh out. Those are the only bits of, of Wales that weren't speaking Welsh for a long time. All the rest spoke Welsh and only Welsh for a very, very, very long time until quite recently. Right up to the border, there's a place near Shrewsbury in Oswestry, Welsh was spoken there within living memory in Shropshire, you know, naturally. It was, the, it was the inherited language of the farmers there. So there wasn't an English... Well, 
by the time that English had started being spoken in, in Wales, it hadn't taken root, it hadn't had enough time to develop a folk singing tradition. So, yes, the traditional culture is conducted in Welsh, basically. So you, there you are in the rock band. What took you in a different direction? What took you into more traditional music? I think I, I had sort of slowly been listening to more acoustic things and, of course, like Bob Dylan and stuff like that. And then... Um, my, my grandfather died, and I inherited a big box of music from him, stuff he had, you know, like, collected old books and things. And that was really, like, a, a switch on, you know, going through these songs. And I've always liked words and lyrics and, and poetry and, and Welsh poetry, which has a very, very long tradition. We've got one of the oldest non-stop literary tradition in Europe, like the oldest uh, surviving Welsh poems. It's so old that it's not from Wales, it's from the north of England at the time where they still spoke Welsh there. Wow. So Cornwall and Wales were the last remnants of the language that was spoken in Britain before the Saxons came. So we're, we're still clinging on to the cliffs here at Aberdaron. But yeah, the, the, the literary tradition goes back centuries to the 6th to 7th centuries and, and it's that an, obviously struck a chord with you, or it struck your imagination. Definitely, those words, you know, in the, the poetry has always appealed to me, and that sort of um, comes up in a lot of folk songs. The, the the words are just poetry, you know, you could read them by themselves, and I and I just got enamoured with them, and um, just was hungry to find more, really. So, when you were looking through your grandfather's music, what sort of songs were you finding? There's lots of leaving songs, farewell songs songs that mention places and, you know, um, monuments in, in the landscape. There's lots of farm, farmer songs, farm hand songs, you know, there's, there's some from here that are, you know, farm workers that warn people of, don't go to the work of that farm, that's, that's, they're very nasty there, they won't treat you well. Later on I found some ballads, we had a broadsheet ballad, it's a tradition also in Wales, and I'm sort of in the process of, you know, sieving through them and finding old gems as well. So uh, plenty of stuff. So it's interesting because uh, uh, Wales, to me, is always associated with the choral tradition, but yeah. that must be a, a later tradition than the songs you're talking about, or, or were the two happening in parallel? There were two, two happening in parallel. As you say, the, the choral tradition has always been strong. Gerald of Wales, Geraldus Cambrensis, writes in the 12th century that unlike other nations that tend to sing in unison, the Welsh sing in harmony. And as many people have you got singing with each other, that's how many voices, different notes there will be, you know. So it's a very long tradition, and it went very, very strong indeed, especially after the Industrial Revolution. You had industries and lots of men working together and forming things like... The mining industry, the mine, steel industry. That's right. Yeah. In the north here, we would have more brass bands, but in the south, in the coal field... The, the choirs were a big, big thing, and um, still today. And also, you would have a, a lot of Methodist uh, chapels in Wales, and choral singing is a very important part of, of services in that denomination. So, yeah, the harmony singing comes very, very naturally with all of that behind you, you know. Yeah, well, you've talked about the fact that this was all very natural, that people had to opt out of, of singing and, and so on, but the kind of tradition that you're now carrying on and the kind of songs that you're performing some of which were written hundreds of years ago and some of which you've written yourself yeah. is that a popular tradition in Wales? It, I wouldn't say it is a very strong tradition really, that's sort of singing songs by yourself you know? there have been a lot of sort of um, collecting and field recordings done but that oral tradition of passing on a song and singing it by yourself it's you know, surprisingly weak really and I would say a lot of it is to do Ironically, with those non-formist you know, Methodist chapels, they loved it when everybody sang together in praise of Jesus and of God. But if you started singing about, you know, laments for shipwrecks, that wasn't so fitting in that setting, you know. And that's affected all kinds of traditions. You know, I would say Wales is one of the few places in Britain that's got a broken fiddle-playing tradition. We did have one, but it, everybody stopped because, you know, the chapel people looked down upon music like that. It's, it's too frivolous, was it, it? Too frivolous. If it's not in praise of Jesus, then it's in praise of the devil. So it's devil's music. And they, actually, the only people that's carried on playing things like the fiddle and the harp, the harp is the, the big instrument in Wales, were the Roma, you know, travellers. Um, they, you know, t took root in Wales and they, they didn't care what the chapels thought. They kept on dancing and playing. And we thank them for it because we've, we've gained a lot... Um, from that tradition. 
Yeah, so the only unbroken musical traditions that we have, really, apart from singing, is harp playing, specifically the triple harp. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. What, yes. what, is, what is typically Welsh about it? So the, this harp, it was developed in Italy, actually, in the 17th century. How do you solve the problem of the, you know, wanting to play chromatic notes on the harp? Because if you put all the strings you know, beside each other, it's too much of a stretch for the hand. They came up with an idea of having two rows to, to begin with, two rows of strings side by side. One row like the white notes on a piano and the other like the black notes. But the problem is then, if you want to only play the white notes, then you would have to have two hands on the one side. So someone said, aha, what if we have three rows of strings? The two on the outside are identical, like the white notes on the piano. But if you do want to play a sharp or a flat, you just reach inside and play the row in the middle. And that ended up being the triple harp, which spread all across Europe and into um, Britain at the time. But then um, the pedal harp came along, which was even more flexible. And this triple harp died out everywhere, except for Wales. We carried on playing it. Why? Because it was light. You could carry it around you very easily, much easier than a pedal harp. And we had a very old you know, tradition of harp playing, and it suited the repertoire, that, the traditional repertoire that we still had. So that is, yes, that's been played non-stop. There's a woman um, on Anglesey, Hiorhaderch, and she was taught orally to play the triple harp, and she can trace her teacher-student lineage on the island of Anglesey back to the 15th century. Wow. Yes. So it, it's a very rich tradition, that's triple yeah. harp playing. Yeah. So how, where do you see yourself fitting in to that tradition? Because some of the songs that you play sound quite contemporary to me. You know, it sounds to me as though you're applying some of the techniques of contemporary acoustic playing to the Welsh traditional language. Is yes. that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm a purist musically, so I, I like to experiment with the arrangements and, and you know, making stuff feel fresh and relevant musically. And also when I play with other people, well, I've recorded a couple of albums with uh, some wonderful musicians, uh, sort of fiddle and harp, but you know, consciously playing it quite fresh and a, a lot of sort of influence from old time and bluegrass music also and jazz and you know, I, lo I also really love early music like Baroque and Renaissance music and flamenco and all of these elements coming into the musical side of it. But yeah, with a traditional core, lyrically, you know, more or less, first and foremost for me is the words and the music comes after. So what are you going to sing for us now? Uh, I'm going to sing one of my own songs that I composed quite recently. And it was after reading, uh, there's a folk tale that we have about Tachian um, Kumkolid, which is, about, it's a story about the oldest animals in the world. Uh, somebody's wanting to know who is the oldest animal in the world and they go oh you should ask you know this animal because he's very old and um, there's a connection with here because there's a place called Boternapwy and one of the the animals is the eagle of Boternapwy which is here and he goes you know are you the oldest animal in the world and she says well I'll tell you how old I am you see this rock I'm standing on here when I was young this was a huge huge crag a huge mountain so huge that I could pick the stars with my beak but every day I've been scratching my beak on it, and now it's only this size. That's how old I am. But I'll tell you, there's an older one than myself, and that's this other animal. And there's this list of animals, one older than the other. And the very oldest one is the owl of Cum Colid, which is a very sort of hard-to-get-to valley in, in Erery, in Snowdonia. So I, I wrote this song basically imagining if I could have a conversation with the oldest animal in the world, which would I ask, you know? Who was the first person to sing a song around the fire? You know, questions to the oldest animal in the world, this is. Yeah. Here we are, wow. Free the canet and win it on. Free the canet to bring our pants. A quiet mounds in Britornant. Free the canet to rear the wall. Sing crachy queen of Fernand. 
Sian kum koli Taranar mest Ar ser tiri veti vel Canu i sakoer Sen prithom man tes Glastir hwyr Si an cwm coli da wyr See if we can walk down by the sea. Then we'll go down these steps onto the uh, beach. Yeah. And I mean, it's just so impressive this white surf coming at us here. Yeah. And you can see the waves going up against the headland, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kesigunion is what we call that, which means white horses. And I know you're a bit of a walker. Are you a fine weather walker or do you mind being out in the cold and wind? I don't mind it too much, but you can't afford to mind it here, really. Especially where, closer to where I live in, by the mountains. It's much more uh, persistent, the rain and the wind, really, there. Usually, that you know, <laughs> you come here for the nice weather. So how does walking fit into your life? Is it an important part of your life? It's become 
more important in recent years, really, yeah. If you're lucky enough to have, you know, a rural setting, just to go for a stroll and not think about anything, it's a, just a form of meditation, really, you know, for myself. Yeah. So, so what really got you engaged in, in walking? It was after I read a, a book called Wild Wales by George Wild Bor- Wales, no, no, Wild you're, Wales you're yes, talking. by an author called George Borrow. George Borrow was an English travel writer in the 19th century, and he walked everywhere. In the 1850s, he did the walking tour of Wales, and he was a, definitely a linguist, and he had learned Welsh. And at that time, of course, many, many people in, in Wales couldn't speak English, so it really sticks out as a travel book of its time, because the other travel books of Wales at the time, it's, it's definitely from an outside perspective and not being able to engage with the culture, you know? But that book is different because he can, and he does, and he's fascinated by poetry and literature more than anything else. And he, you know, he goes to visit these places that are connected with, with these poets that he had heard about. So, and yeah, and he walks everywhere. So that's really sort of uh, got me sort of, uh, you know, to start walking. And even now, if I, if I need to be somewhere and I've got enough time, I'll walk rather than drive or cycle, you know. I had one stint of quite extreme. I walked, to, you know, to my gigs with my guitar in the back. A bit, you know. So what sort of distances were you doing? Well, I think the longest one I did was from Carnarvon to Nanskurthair, and was, well, it was about a, almost a four-hour walk, <laughs> you know, and I stayed with my friend. And the people there was like, are you bunkers? <laughs> but, uh, well, maybe I was a little bit. There's something meditative about walking, isn't there? And there's something that allows you... I, I think, you know, because we've been doing this podcast so much, that it connects you with the landscape in a way that no other mode of transport does. Definitely. And it's sort of, you know, you've got time to... When you're, when you're in a car, if you have a glimpse of something... Uh, Interesting. It's you know it's gone in a second. And, and in Snowdonia, it must just be spectacular. Yes, yes. So well, I I live in a place called Rachib, which is well nestled between the mountains. The range that's above my house is called the Carnedal, and there's so many things to find there. You know, there's a rock just above where I live. There's this big sort of glacial rock there, and it's got sword sharpening marks on it. Oh really? Yeah, lots of these these sort of linear. Uh, marks in it and you know people used to think oh you know it might be following me like a scythe or something but something that no 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 that's definitely a sword you know so it must be it's you know impossible to date that kind of thing but it's the you warriors know, of old that's were, were, that's right and there's another place called Penhuintan which would translate something like the head of the complaining fire now you ask what the, what the hell is that the complaining fire well, some people might remember from reading or watching Lord of the Rings, Tolkien has this uh, this thing where if, if there was news to be passed, there were the, these beacons, these fires that were lit on the tops of, you know, high places, and there was a chain of, of these lights, and that's exactly what's happened there. So if the, the English army, for instance, crossed the River Dee by Chester, well, they would know in Aberdaron within the hour because of the beacons. Because of the beacons. And they would have time to muster up their armies, you know. And there's a place, yes, near where I live, called Penhuintan, which is the telling fire or the complaining fire. And it's all about, it's about that, you know. And that's, that's for me, you know, knowing what names mean and words mean, it just opens up the whole stories and, and sort of the history of these places, you know. Once we forget what the words mean, then all of that is lost with it, you know. There was a, a housing estate built near Cardiff quite recently. And um, very quickly after building it, it got flooded. But then the Welsh name for the place is like, it translates something like the place that always gets flooded. You know, that's the Welsh <laughs> name of the place. Warning. If you knew that, I could have told you that. You know what I mean? Don't build a house there. Eh? <laughs> so, knowing these things is really practical. Very well, practical. <laughs> yes, life saving. <laughs> This is a, called Farwelli Langavella Chlon, which is a, a young man's farewell to everybody that he knows and all of his family and friends because he's going away on, on, you know, on the, the fleet, the English fleet, going out to fight some wars and, you know, probably never going to see his loved ones again. It's just a, a nice song about saying goodbye to all the things that he loves. Ar merched i fan gigi dorperon 
Rwy'n mynd i weld pa'r un sydd waith A'n wlad fy hun er gwledydd peth Fel mae'r tio nes i yn y blaen Nes i mi ddod i dre pont y fain Ac yn o'r oedd yn tyn fawr i sbort Yn listio'r gwir at y diwc o fiorc Yn listio'r gwir at y diwc o fiorc Mi drois ym hen a gyr i'w di Yn air ar arian y ddynon ffyrri Y drums o'r ffeif sydd yn caru o'r swn A listio nes at y leit dragwn A gyr i'm lain i llundan y fri A diw ti cael y daeth arno mni Sef handl o'r drill a'r cleddyf noeth Y bwlet plwm a'r pwd o'r pwd Y bwlet sbwm ar pwd o'r pwd Farwell fy nhad, farwell fy mam Sydd wedi fy magu am dwy ni lan Yn dyner iawn o flaen y tam A chan farwell fy o'r merched glan Os gofyn rai pwy wnaeth y gan Wel dwedwch chi mae merch fach lan Sydd yn hireith i nos a dyr Yw hanwyl gariad gael bod yn rhy Yw hanwyl gariad gael bod yn rhy And, and have you travelled the world um, playing and singing? I've been very lucky in the, in the past few years, yes. I've been involved in musical projects. There was one called Tosta, which brought together lots of minority languages in the west of Europe. So, you know, uh, Basque, Galician, we had Sc Scottish and Irish musicians. Um, and we were travelling all, all in all of these countries, singing all in our, you know, in, in our languages. Um, I've, I've, had, I've sang in, in the States and in, in uh, Colombia and Argentina a few times. So, yeah, I feel very privileged to be able to bring my, my language and my music and people to other places and that people are, are happy to listen to it. And, and are you somebody who likes to acquire new skills? Because I, I think I, I read that you were learning a craft skill uh, as well. <laughs> yes. Yes, there was a, a time where I wasn't sure if only singing would be enough to sort of pay the bills and I happened to visit a man called Trevor Owen who lived in Cricieth just the east of here and he's a clog maker it ties in with the other musical tradition the unbroken musical tradition that I was going to talk about which is clog dancing which is also a tradition in other parts of Britain in the north of England yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we had it here in Wales also and you know clogs meaning that it's only the, the soles of, of the uh, wooden the rest are just like a leather shoe but it made a very nice sound on, you know, on wooden floors. Um, and yes, there was a big clog dancing tradition in Wales. And Trevor Owen was making them. And he was one of the very, very few people in Britain that was still, still making clogs. And he was looking for an apprentice. And I thought, well, why not? You know? So I spent two years with him learning to make clogs. So what are the skills that you need to make good clogs? Well, the big one is the, the carving. So you've got this bench and a 
what they call a stock knife, which is a big knife with a long handle which you you hold out and it's it's hooked on to this movable like metal hoop and you hold a piece of wood in your left hand and you hold this uh, the one in the right uh, this blade in the right and you carve it rather than sawing or cutting you carve it like you would a spoon or a bowl to make the the curves that one needs to you know so that your foot sits in this piece of wood and if it's made well it is one of the most comfortable things you can wear but yeah making it well you need you need quite a bit of experience and was he a hard taskmaster did he you know keep you working hard he, ah, no he was he was very generous with <laughs> generous with his knowledge and and we we shared a lot of interests he had been living in in england for a very very long time and he was very active in the english folk scene in morris dance he was chairman of the morris dance society at one point but before that he used to make clogs for coal miners in the north of england it was his job to you know make the foot sweat for the miners but then the pits closed and he was out of a job you know that sort of a domino effect and he was employing people also so that's when he started making them for traditional dance but yeah it was a pleasure to to work with him and he's he's taught other people as well and i'm i'm very relieved to say because i i had a bit of a uh, not knowing what to do because i the singing was going quite well but i would find myself you know rejecting gigs to make clogs and I thought, well, you know what? I'm, I'm much, much better at singing than I am at making clogs. And it was a big relief to me when I found out that one of his other students, Simon Brock, started making it full time. And he's, you know, he's a thousand times better than I was. And he makes wonderful, wonderful clogs. And I thought, right, OK, he can, he can stick with that. I've still got the kit if I ever want to get back into it. But it, it, it felt it's like a, a fallback position. If yes. The music doesn't. It doesn't. It, when when, when people have fed up with me <laughs> wailing in in their churches, then I'll start making clogs again. <laughs> yes. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you and, and to hear your music and your stories today. So thank you so much, Gwilym, for for hosting. It, it's been an absolute pleasure. Gwilym Byrne Rees in Aberdaran on the west of Wales. And if you loved listening to Gwilym's music, you can see it in our archive, Folk on Foot on Film. We have filmed it. And all you have to do is sign up to become a patron of Folk on Foot and you'll get access to those films and 150 more that we have shot on our travels around the UK. It'll only cost you £10 a month and every penny you give will go back to making more episodes of Folk on Foot. So if you want to sign up, go to folkonfoot.com and click on the Support Us button. We have a growing army of supporters who make sure that we keep making you the podcast that you enjoy. So please join us. Join us.